Um, so welcome to the Economy for All Town Hall. Thank you so much for coming out tonight for this event, which is hosted by Rights and Democracy Education Fund as part of a series of town halls moderated by Vermont Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman. And tonight's events are also sponsored by Rights and Democracy Project, Vermont NEA, Planned Parenthood, Vermont Action Fund, and Public Assets Institute. Um, so my name is Ginger Knight. Um, I'm a junior here at E32, and I live in East Montpelier. I'm a current student rep on RAD's leadership committee, and recently my friend Mia and I made a student survey to collect information about teenagers who currently have jobs at E32. Um, one of the questions was, do you, have, do you make less than $13 per hour? And 43% um, said yes, they make less than $13 per hour. This is just under 50% of students who make less than $13 per hour. Um, I'm part of this event because this issue is crucial to our lives. So tonight we're going to talk about a lot of the struggles that are facing many of the families around Vermont. And uh, we, the important steps that we can take towards making an economy that really works for all of us. I'm Mia, I also live in East Montpelier, and I'm also a junior. And I'm here because I think it's my duty as an engaged citizen to stand up for issues that I think are so important. Yeah, so um, at Rights and Democracy, we believe that we can and we must do better to ensure that public policies are in place and to ensure that every single person in our community has the ability to lead lives in dignity, where we can all have a chance to be happy, healthy, and thrive. Um, there are a lot of great things about our communities and our country, but if we take a step back and look at our economy, we see how we are in the wealthy, wealthiest country um, in the history of the world and experiencing incredible technological um, growth. But then we see the extreme levels of inequality with millions of people working full time and even two to three jobs, but still living in poverty. We see that despite spending more than twice as much per person on health care, millions of people are, doing, are going without health care. We see life expect expectancy of men in the country declining, our communities facing an opioid and drug overdose crisis. We see our communities in crisis and people pitted against each other by race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, ability, and age, and historically marginalized communities facing systems of oppression which still need to be dismantled. And ultimately, we also see and hear scientists detailing how our economy and energy systems are destroying the very life support systems of our beautiful planet. We believe that we can have an economy that works for all of us and that is in harmony with the planet and all of the other living things who live here with us. Um, we know that here in Vermont we can lead the way, so our state is one of the first states to head down the path in the direction that our country really needs to go with advancing human rights and building a real democracy where we have a universal health care system and invest in the health of our communities where we advance a Green Mountain New Deal to invest in renewable energy, clean water, and public transit systems, creating jobs and making sure all workers get paid a livable wage, and we support strong local economies. It's not going to be easy, but with all of us playing our part, we can definitely make it happen. Um, so thank you again for coming out tonight, and please give a warm welcome to our moderator, Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman. Okay. Well, thank you both. Um, I just want to say uh, to Ginger and Maya or Mia, Mia, I'm sorry, that um, uh, I'm so excited for the organizing you're doing. I'm excited for your engagement in democracy and the process. Uh, I want to let you know that sometimes more people show up to events and sometimes fewer. Uh, having been involved in Vermont politics now for uh, as a candidate, 23, 24 years, as an elected person for 21 years, uh, I have driven three hours to events with two people. I have driven three hours to events with 30 people. I have driven three hours to events with 400 people. Uh, the work that we do to make an economy for all, 
to improve our communities sometimes has big meetings and sometimes it has small. But what is exciting for me is to see uh, folks at your age engaging and being part of that building of that movement because all the success that we've had uh, while we have farther to go on many topics, the various successes that have happened over time are because of the hard work that people put in uh, of all ages, organizing meetings that sometimes five people show up to, sometimes 15, and sometimes 500. Uh, so thank you uh, for your organizing, your doing that survey, uh, and for the courage that it takes to stand in front of a group of people with a microphone, which after you do a little bit more, you get really comfortable and you make mistakes and you laugh at your mistakes and so forth. Uh, but at first you feel like, oh my God, I said something not quite right and it's really okay. We are all human in this room and we have a range of perspectives of people in this room. Um, I want to say we've been having these town meetings throughout the state. Uh, again, we've had some with 30, 40, 50 people, and we've had some that have fewer. But it's been really interesting, the takeaway of the conversations with respect to uh, recognizing where our society has gotten to with respect to our economy, with respect to uh, disparities in wealth and income, uh, our society's disparities in health outcomes, especially with respect to what we pay relative to what many people in different countries around the world pay, which is often half, and yet they have better health outcomes in terms of uh, child mortality, uh, life longevity. You know, you'd think with the United States and in Vermont as well, us paying through the roof for our health care that we would have the number one outcomes of the world. Uh, but we are far from that. We're often 10th, 15th, 25th in different rankings and metrics. Uh, so the question that we have to ask and that is asked by this town meeting series around the state is, if we're the wealthiest country in the world, and we are the most advanced country in the world. Why have we not achieved what I would say should be a goal for all of us, which is an economy that works for everybody, where actually if folks are earning uh, a wage that they can actually work a reasonable number of hours, but then actually also have time for family, which for those of us that are around in the 80s and 90s, family values was the big talking point in politics well, family values means having a, a wage that allows you to be home with your family. So you can enrich your children with uh, decent ethics around work ethic, decent ethics around neighbors and community, decent uh, values around uh, helping those in the community who may not be able to help themselves because of the roulette of genetics or circumstances they're born into or any of the other things that um, start us out on different bases uh, around the pad, the baseball diamond. Uh, and to me, if we don't have basic wages that allow for folks to be home with their families or to contribute in their communities, cleaning the side of the road or volunteering to help someone uh, build a ramp on their house so they can get in or out uh, if they're mobility challenged, then what are we and who are we as a society? And these are the kinds of questions that some of this conversation is about for universal health care, for individual rights and freedoms with respect to women and their bodies and the ability to make the choices that women need to make uh, for their health and choice and their autonomy, uh, for their economic circumstances, and for each of our economic circumstances. We should all be afforded good public education so that no matter what your background is or where you come from, you have the opportunity to learn the opportunity to then uh, climb the ladder in the old pull yourself up by the bootstraps argument that some, sometimes is made in, in the economy that we're in uh, and in political circles. And so this conversation and the presentations we're going to have are about some of these different uh, aspects of our society what the conversation could be in a, in a developed, civilized, economically uh, bountiful for some and not for others society, but how do we through our democracy and through a vibrant, vibrant democracy and through changing laws, but it's not all about laws, it's also through changing our own mindsets and our community mindsets, make it so that we don't have folks living on the street, we don't have folks uh, not going in for primary care because they don't have the access to health care or health care opportunities that they should have, uh, which then costs us all more money. 
sometimes this conversation is actually also about penny wise, pound foolish. And you know, there's times when an investment up front actually saves you a lot of money down the line. Uh, whereas if you don't get that care when you should, it costs a lot more money to go to the emergency room with an infected cut than it would have been to go in earlier to get a, get a cut cleaned out and a couple of stitches. So thankfully in Vermont, we've mostly gotten over that hurdle, but we're a long way from getting over that hurdle. And we also look at the fact that we spend about as much on health care in our state as the whole state budget. Something's wrong with that picture. And there are decent arguments that there are different ways to solve that. But generally, um, when you look at the systems of the world that actually truly save money and create better outcomes, it's not just through the race to the bottom uh, free market system. It's through a combination of universal systems uh, that make sure everybody's in, everybody's covered, everybody contributes. And, uh, you end up with better outcomes that way, with far less money going towards the administrative rigmarole of who's paying and where are they paying from and denials and then battling to get it paid and all that cost in the system that could actually be about health care. Uh, so there are a number of conversations that we'll have today. Uh, we, I didn't even touch on climate. And certainly when we're talking about our youth, uh, my 13-year-old daughter, um, it, it it's really a deeply personal issue. When I first got elected statewide three years ago, uh, that night um, I went to bed pretty sad. And I would have traded my election, I would still trade being in this office today uh, for someone in the Oval Office who actually recognized science uh, with respect to many things, but in particular with respect to climate change. And the, the fact that we're already past many of the tipping points uh, but we, we have an opportunity if we actually tackle uh, climate change with a Green New Deal or a Green Mountain New Deal, as you stated, that actually builds jobs and works towards a climate that is livable um, out there uh, for our children and our future grandchildren and so forth. I will tell you as a farmer, uh, no single weather event, of course, can be directly pinned to climate change. But two years ago was one of the wettest years. And this last year, depending where you are in Vermont, you either had an incredibly wet year or even 100 miles to the north, you had one of the driest years that's ever happened. Um, I will tell you that on our farm over these last two years, uh, we've lost thousands. Just this last year in the fall, we were down about 35,000 pounds of food between cabbages that didn't size up because of lack of water, carrots that didn't size up because of lack of water, because we ran our ponds empty and we had no more water. And on the one hand, that's just an economic loss for an individual business. And on the other hand, it's a bit of a canary in the coal mine about what's really changing with our systems. And today at the State House, there are folks who were involved in the ski industry. And you want to talk about jobs in the economy uh, and what could happen to Vermont as climate change continues to progress if we lose uh, the ski industry or a significant portion of the ski season, just think about what that means for our economy. If our maple season, as it continues to move earlier, also gets truncated by sort of too cold for a while and then quickly too warm, what does that do for our economy? So anybody that doesn't link climate change to our economy, I think is really not seeing the dots that are pretty clearly on the map in front of us. So uh, I want to recognize uh, a number of legislators are, who are here, um, and I want to thank folks who are here from the legislature, again, from a range of perspectives, because uh, I think it's really, we're very lucky in Vermont that regardless of what party people run from or for or under, whatever banner it is, once elected, it's about getting out and listening to conversations from all perspectives. And I, I really think we have something special here in Vermont in that regard. Uh, and so we have legislators, I think, of, of every party here. Uh, we've got Senator Cummings and Senator Perchlick. Uh, Senator Cummings in the back, Senator Perchlick in the front. Uh, Senator Polina had planned to be here, but I don't think he's going to be able to make it. Uh, Senator Cummings serves on the Health and Welfare Committee and the Finance Committee as chair. Senator Perchlick serves on Transportation Committee and then the Education Committee. And then we also have 
have Representatives LeClaire and Gosselin here, I think right here near the front. Uh, Representative LeClaire serves on the Government Operations Committee and Representative Gosselin on Judiciary Committee. So you actually have a wide range of views, um, not only politically, but also representation from different committees that are impacted uh, and, and can impact our economy, our education, our climate, transportation, uh, judiciary in terms of an economy that works for all is also about equal employment opportunities. Um, and I believe Representative Donahue may be coming a little bit late, uh, but she had another meeting and she also, uh, she serves on health care, so yet another committee that's covered. Uh, with those um, opening remarks and democracy, of course, uh, I'm going to invite up you gave me the copy that doesn't have a uh, page um, uh, is going to come up to speak on behalf of Planned Parenthood, uh, who's a co-sponsor of this event and uh, some other of these town meetings to speak a little bit about the legislation that's happening uh, and how to stay involved and the importance of it. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, my name is Paige Fieser. I'm the Vermont Public Affairs Organizer with Planned Parenthood of Northern New England and Planned Parenthood Vermont Action Fund. And I'm very excited to talk to folks um, about reproductive rights, especially from an economic context, because I think that's definitely a perspective that doesn't always get thought about um, when we're talking on, on the issue of human rights. Um, and certainly, um, the ability to decide when and whether to have a child is one of the most important factor in a childbearing person's economic well-being over the course of their lifetime. And having that control allows people to increase their own education, make better investments in their early work and career choices, and create better outcomes um, for their children. And on a societal uh, context, access to birth control, including abortion, is tied to increased labor force participation, higher earnings, more advanced careers, and better financial conditions for children as well as families. Um, and just to give you uh, context from, from a women's perspective, women make up nearly half the workforce and play a vital role in our economy's success. And when women do have access to the full range of reproductive uh, health care, it helps them control their lives, their health, and their future, and we're all better off. Um, so certainly, um, since 2011, um, we've seen some really disastrous abortion restriction uh, laws happening in states all over the country. Um, since 2011, over 400 abortion restrictions um, have been passed. This year alone, over 250 have been at least introduced in over 30 states around the country. Um, unfortunately, restricting abortion access threatens economic security for childbearing people, and denial of abortion leads to economic hardship. Um, and many of those seeking an abortion already experience economic hardships, um, have had incomes below the federal poverty level, and three quarters reported not having enough money to pay for basic living expenses. And instead of being able to access a wanted abortion and giving birth, um, it resulted in almost a four-fold increase in odds that a woman's household income was below the federal poverty level and a greater likelihood of reporting not to be able to cover basic living needs. So people who are denied uh, abortion all across the country are more likely to be enrolled in public safety programs like the temporary assistance for needy families, food assistance programs, women, uh, and the WIC program compared to women who did have access to abortion care. So uh, certainly Planned Parenthood Vermont Action Fund um, is very concerned on what's happening on a national level um, and certainly at the end of last year uh, with the confirmation of uh, uh, Supreme Court um, Judge uh, Brett Kavanaugh, we were certainly um, very concerned about what the future of abortion access and reproductive rights are um, here in Vermont. We are just so very proud of our legislature for um, introducing two important pieces of legislation, number one being the Abortion Rights Bill, H-57, which seeks to codify um, the abortion access that Vermonters have had for the past 46 years. 
And then secondly, a reproductive liberty amendment, Prop 5, uh, which seeks to amend the, uh, the Constitution to include um, reproductive autonomy um, and including it as an important part of a person being able to maintain their dignity and their, and their ability to make their own choices. So uh, with that, um, in thinking about how to support these two important pieces of legislation, the Prop 5 especially being um, historic, um, and no other country, uh, or, no, I'm sorry, and no other state in our country has um, tried to put forward such an important constitutional amendment to a state constitution. Um, so certainly, we definitely do need public support um, in pushing forward these pieces of legislation. Um, certainly, one thing I do have to mention is that um, the House of Representatives, uh, the Human Services Committee, on Wednesday is hosting a public hearing on Prop 5 um, from 5 to 7 p.m. Um, in the well of the State House or in the House Chamber. And we are trying to encourage, if, if reproductive rights is important to you, certainly uh, make an appearance there. Our representatives need to see and also hear from people who support reproductive rights. I'm happy to talk with anyone after this uh, presentation um, about that opportunity and how you can get involved. Um, certainly, and also staying educated um, about these two pieces of legislation is certainly important as well. I have a sign-up sheet here, and I'm happy to um, get you signed up on there. We do really good updates on the fabulous work that our uh, legislators are doing around the state. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Paige. And uh, next, we have Mia Smith, who uh, was up already, but we'll give a little more information, I think, on uh, raising minimum wage and paid family leave, right? And um, you know, again, I want to thank the range of folks who come, and I hope we will have a robust conversation. Uh, so thank you. Here's Mia. Hi again. I'm here on behalf of RAD to talk about raise the wage and paid family and medical leave, which are two issues that are really important to a number of Vermonters and our legislators have been working hard to ensure that Vermonters' right to a livable wage is protected and that we don't have to worry about losing our jobs just because we need to look after ourselves or after a loved one. Um, after Governor Scott vetoed both an increase to the minimum wage and a paid family and medical leave program last year, we now have the potential for a veto-proof majority in both the House and the Senate to pass the bill this session. Raising the minimum wage in five steps to $15 an hour by 2024 will give as many as 50,000 Vermonters a raise over the next five years, especially to women and people of color who are more likely to be working in low-wage jobs in Vermont. It will ensure that our lowest wage full-time workers are earning enough for a basics needs budget and will save these folks every year from applying and reapplying for multiple economic safety net programs. The five-year path will also give Vermont small businesses time to adjust and every year we'll inject hundreds of millions of dollars into our economy, our local economy. A paid family and medical leave insurance program will benefit every employed Vermonter with only a tiny deduction from your paycheck. Everyone at some point needs to take time off from work to care for a new or a sick family loved or loved one, or to even take care of yourself. We know that the voluntary program proposed by the governor this year doesn't work, so we need to keep working to ensure that strong support for a publicly administered mandatory paid family and medical leave insurance program can be passed this year. These two policies together are really big steps forward for the most vulnerable working Vermonters and their families and will also help to bolster the middle class in Vermont. Because we have so many new legislators, which is awesome, we need to keep organizing and connecting working Vermonters with their representatives. Help us reach out to low-wage workers in your community with our Raise Up Vermont Storyteller Forum so that we can reach as many of the 50,000 low-wage workers in our state as possible and ensure that Vermonters' right to a livable wage and paid family and medical leave is respected and upheld. Nice job. Thank you. 
And next we have Sarah Lyons from the Public Assets Institute. And uh, just by way of introduction, the Public Assets uh, Institute is a nonprofit that works here in Montpelier, really doing a lot of economic analysis uh, around our economic system and, and the different how it affects different folks at different points in the system. Uh, I also am remiss in my opening, I forgot to mention, um, and he'll understand that I do this every time, but um, I've been, uh, two years ago it happened for about a month or two and then it became less interesting for them, but apparently it's interesting again for the Republican Governors Association to film me at public events. So I am being filmed today, as are anybody else who speaks, uh, and the questions that you ask, I hope folks will still feel comfortable asking any questions you want. I certainly feel comfortable with any answer that I'm going to give. Uh, and just to give you a little bit of a fun time, I think you've got a Montreal Canadiens jacket on. Um, now, what's the symbol on the side there? Okay, great. In that case, I was going to make a little fun of the fact that it was Montreal because I was like, come on, Canada's got a universal health care system. You can't do that while you're filling for the RGA, but it's not. So um, that's the joke I would have made. Uh, in any case, um, Sarah Lyons from the Public Assets Institute, please come on up and talk to us a little bit about uh, some of the wage issues and some of the work you've been doing. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, I'm Sarah Lyons from Public Assets, um, right up into, uh, yeah. um, and I just wanted to tell you a little bit about our work. Um, public Assets' mission uh, is to improve the well-being of Vermonters, specifically low and moderate income Vermonters. Um, we do state tax, budget, um, economic research and analysis to understand how Vermonters are doing. We communicate it clearly, and we make policy recommendations that best serve Vermonters. Our goal is to provide important context in uh, public debates. Um, we sift through the data, we identify trends and in information that aren't part of the conversation, and we make people aware of it. A um, couple of quick examples. Uh, we have a new minimum wage report. I was hoping to have that tonight. Uh, didn't quite uh, get it done, but uh, probably early next week. Um, the goal of this report is to really question the timing of minimum wage. Um, is it the right time to raise minimum wage? All the concerns that we hear about why not to raise minimum wage, um, those concerns are going to be there whenever we raise minimum wage. So the question that we're asking um, is how are the folks doing who are making minimum wage? And if they're worse off, then it's the right time to raise minimum wage. So that's what we focused on in this report. And look for that next week. Um, another example, quick example about our work is migration. Um, a lot of what drives the conversation in the State House is that we can't tax Vermont high income Vermonters. Um, or they'll leave the state. Um, we know from uh, work and research across the country that that's just not true. But we wanted to look at what's happening in Vermont. Um, I did bring one of these reports, uh, if anybody wants one, and it's available on our website. Um, but we looked at the top 10 states that Vermonters move to. Uh, when they leave the state. And we looked at the top 10 states that people come from when they move to Vermont. And guess what we found? They're pretty much the same states. Um, Vermonters do move to New Hampshire and Florida, where there's no income tax. But roughly the same amount of people move to Vermont from those same states. So what we find um, is that most Vermonters stay put. Uh, a small percentage of people move in and out of the state every year. Um, we might all know someone who threatens to leave the state because taxes are high, but that doesn't mean that it's really affecting Vermont, and it doesn't mean it should drive our policy. So that's two examples of what public assets does to push back on persistent myths that can sometimes drive policy decisions. Um, we'd love to share our work with you. We hope you find it useful. Uh, we're on Facebook, we are on Twitter, and I sent a clipboard around. 
um, people can join our email list. Uh, I don't send a lot, so if anyone can attest to that, um, there's not a ton, so I will not fill your inbox, but I'll let you know when we have new material. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Sarah. Uh, and we have um, two senators here today who we will offer the chance to speak for a moment, and then we'll end up with a panel up front. And, uh, and actually, if either of the two representatives want to speak, we'll give you a couple minutes as well. Uh, and then we'll be up here to answer questions uh, from you all. So. Uh, Last time I had Senator Cummings go first, and, and she said no. So this time I'll have Senator Perchlick go first, and then uh, we'll alternate it around for equality purposes. Uh, Senator Perchlick, you want to offer a few words? Sure. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. I'm going to be pretty quick because I'd much rather hear from from you all and, and have more of a discussion. But just for my, I'm a new senator, just got elected this last time, and so I'm just really focused on, on the committees and I, that I'm, the committee work that I'm doing on transportation and education. And as far as the issues that we're talking about today, definitely climate action has been something that the transportation committee has been talking a lot about. And you know, the, the chair of that committee has been on the committee for 34 years, and he's telling me like for 35 or 33 of those 34 years it's mostly been about potholes and paving and paving and potholes which is important and especially after this winter we're definitely focused on that as well but this year we spent more time than anything that uh, any other issues about electrification of our transportation sector and how do we think about our whole public transit system in a different way and how are we going to both be for equity and get people to work as we found what I found interesting in, in the committee that we learned is most people take public transit are taking it to get to work. And we, we want to have folks have a, a way to keep their jobs. And we have programs like Reach Up that require you to have a job that we got to also make sure there's an equitable way for people to, to get to work and we continue the support of our public transportation. And we're thinking about new ways like passenger trains, but we're also really focusing on the, the basic transportation that we have of, of buses throughout the state and hopefully that we can do more in rural areas. But as I said, we're really focusing and what I'm excited about in the committee is electric vehicles, but electrification of our transportation sector in general. Happy to talk more about that. And on education, where I've been happy to, to learn about on that is that there's a real interest on how we address Vermont's problem, that we have a very high high school graduation rate, but a very low rate of high school graduates finishing college or going to college. And part of it is our college education in, in Vermont is too expensive. And we've had a lot of students come in there and talk about they went to Vermont colleges, so you know, this is like Castleton and Northern University, and come out with $100,000 of debt. And how, how do we address that? And it's not something we're going to pass a bill this year and have free college next year, but we're going to start the conversation of, of how we can support our institutes of higher education in the state and, and support those Vermonters that want to go on for secondary degrees, whether it be a technical degree at VTC or a four-year degree at one of the colleges. We really need to, to think about that and how we're going to work on that. So it's been exciting to work on that and also some early education work that we've been doing about making sure we really nurture our youngest Vermonters because those are going to be the, the Vermonters are tomorrow. So we need to make sure we're, we're the care and nurturing of our of our children should be the top priority. So that's been exciting work as well. So I'll end there and turn it over to Senator Cummings, Chair of Finance. Thank you, and thank you for coming out today. Um, it's good to see young people here. Uh, when I was your age, young people were very involved. We were picketing in the streets and parading around state houses and sitting in in various offices. Um, and then young people went away. We, uh, we seemed to get out of the political system. And it's good to see you be back. It's good to get the energy and the enthusiasm. And it, it encourages us. and it. I think says to those of us that have been at this for a while that it's worthwhile, that there's a future, and um, it's, a, it's a good thing that we're doing. I serve on the Health and Welfare Committee. We um, authored and brought to the Senate Proposition 5 two weeks ago. 
um, that's now gone to the House, and it will eventually go out um, to a public vote. So you will be seeing that come out in the next. We have to vote a second time. It has to go through two bienniums. So it will be two years from now, 2022, for it goes out. Um, it's, a, it's a long process, but it will uh, put the right to reproductive autonomy into our Constitution. And we did that not tied to the right to privacy, uh, which other states have done, and that was the basis for Roe v. Wade, because we were concerned that uh, Roe v. Wade and that connection to privacy or whether or not privacy is guaranteed in the federal constitution could be turned over that we want. So we, ours is tied to the basic right and liberty of the individual in Vermont to determine their own life course. And that's out. Um, we have, we're talking about trying to create a more livable society and how that's connected to um, the economy and the rest of the world. We have a fantastic child care bill in Senate Health and Welfare. It will, um, over, over the next three years, if it passes, and if they can get the money for the computer system, um, set child care costs at a percentage of your income, and that's what you pay. Um, no, if you have one, two, three, or five kids in child care, that's what you pay. We've had some very, um, we had most of the committee in tears and the room, and the room was packed, listening to one mother talk about how um, her child care closed, she had an infant, she could not find other child care, and this was in, she worked for the state, this was in the Montpelier area. Because she couldn't find child care, she eventually had to leave her job, she lost her home, she lost her self-esteem, she was in tears, she felt like she failed herself, she failed her children, um, she ended up working in a grocery store and living in a friend's back bedroom. Um, finally has found, uh, found some child care, but this was after like two years, found some child care, is back working with the state, but only 30 hours an attempt, which means she gets no benefits. So she has just gone way back. Um, I've had all kinds of people call and say they um, have given up work because they can't find child care. They, uh, are, they end up back on state systems, um, or they are determining how many children they're, they're going to have because of the cost of, of child care. They can't afford a second child. Now, we need second children in our schools. We need to grow our population. In, we're, we're aging. Um, those decisions should not be, have to be made on the availability of child care. I served on the um, Minimum Wage Study Committee several years ago, and I have always supported raising the minimum wage to a livable wage. I put my first family leave bill in 11 years ago. Um, I know this because my grandson just turned 11. They, they live in Canada, and I got to watch my daughter-in-law be allowed to take up to a year in Quebec off with partial pay, by pay, so that she could bond with her child. At the same time, I was watching the young lawyers that work for us try to get out and get down to childcare so they could nurse their baby, so they could get back, so they could work, and just said, this isn't good. This is an important time for mothers to bond with their children, for parents to bond with their children. That bill is there. Then we get to the other side of it, which is finance, and how do we pay for all of this? We have some great new pro programs out there, but we essentially have a safety net in this state that is in shreds. We have not come up with the money in 10 years since the recession to increase our, our, our mental health agencies to um, the, we haven't increased the allowance that somebody on Medicaid in a hospital gets to buy toothbrush, toothpaste, and a new nightgown in 10 years. Um, 
and so this, the, the stress is coming in the, in the legislature, I think, about where do we spend the money? Do we spend it on mending that safety net before we do new programs? Do we spend it on new programs? Do we spend it on child care? Do we spend it on family leave? Or can we, in fact, afford everything? And that's the discussion you're going to hear. But it will be a civil, and it will be a Vermont-style discussion. Uh, so I want to make sure if either of the two you want to speak, I just have to call out Representative LeClaire for a second because um, he's usually one of the top one, two, or three uh, March Madness uh, pool uh, guessers at the State House. We have about 75 people participate. And the reason I say guesser is because people like him actually know what they're doing, and he ends up doing pretty well. And then uh, I take about 10 minutes and fill out my bracket and usually end up somewhere in the top 10 with complete guesswork. Uh, and randomly enough, this year, without even picking the winning team, uh, I won the bracket. So I have to rub it in a little bit um, because uh, I really shouldn't win the bracket based on how little knowledge I have of, uh, of, the, of the tournaments. But um, so Representative LeClaire or Representative Gosselin, do you want to speak? Representative Crash. And then we'll invite our other speakers up and we'll do some Q&A. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lieutenant <laughs> Governor. Now, of course, a lot of what we're going to talk about up here tonight is a bit about perspective. It seems how he brought up the NCAA double uh, basketball brackets. It's a little bit a matter of perspective in that, yes, he did win it because one of the teams he picked actually won it. But another perspective to look at is who picked the most number of teams that won. I picked 47, so I picked more that won than he did. By one. By one. So it is a matter of perspective, but congratulations. Thank you did an excellent job. Appreciate it. Um, my name is Rob Leclerc. I'm one of the two state representatives out of Barrytown. I am also the um, House Minority Leader, Assistant House Minority Leader for the Republican Caucus. For those of you who don't know this, there are Republicans in Vermont, <laughs> and I am one of them. Um, Again, it's a matter of perspective. What you're going to see probably tonight is that there is more agreement than not about what the issues are. Where the disagreement comes quite often is to what the solutions are. We, as Republicans, believe health care. We believe clean air, clean water. We want a lot of the same things that everybody else does, where the question is, is who's going to pay and how much? I'm very excited that you two young ladies are as involved as you are. It's great to have people involved. It's one thing to stand there and point out what the issues are. Now you've got to stay involved and help come up with what those solutions are. Um, that's, that's where it really comes. Minimum wage, you know, let's talk about that. We, we want everybody to be able to live with dignity and have access to good quality health care and all the other things that go along with that. But there is another part of that, too, in that, say, the, the minimum wage. I'm a small business owner. I've been a small business owner for many years. I also work for a large corporation for many, many years. Sometimes it depends, again, on perspective as to whether you've ever signed the front of a paycheck or you've always signed the back of one. Small business in Vermont is the backbone of the state. About 80% of our businesses in Vermont have 20 employees or under. I know many, many small business owners who don't take a paycheck home every week. I'm not worried about the Walmarts. I don't care about McDonald's. They can take care of themselves. It's their choice whether they stay in Vermont or not. I care about the businesses that are on Main Street and State Street Montpelier, Main Street Waterbury, South Main Street, North Main Street, and Barrie. Those are the businesses that I care about. And it's a tough climate to do business in this state. We have a lot of different challenges ahead of us. You know, I've heard pay family leave. We're actually are for that. We really are. We just disagree that it should be a mandate. And we do think that the governor's version has got a lot of merit in it. So there's a lot more commonality here than not. It's just a matter of how we get there. 
But one thing I will say, and I think Senator Cummings said that, we do do it the Vermont way. We will have good, robust discussions, but it's always respectful. And one of the things that we really do try to do is we listen to each other. But we can quite often agree to disagree. But thank you. Um, do you want to speak briefly as well? Yeah. A couple minutes real quick, and then we'll have all of our guests come up uh, to do the Q&A. Uh, yeah, sure, come on up. So, uh, hi. And I uh, really appreciate what, what you're doing and your knowledge and all this stuff. And the most important thing is being involved. So I come from the same side as, as where Rob comes from. I happen to be a small business owner. I started off making minimum wage. Actually, I made less than minimum wage because I was a farmer. So, but my first job out, I think it was minimum wage or maybe it was 10 cents over. And I think it was $2.35. Don't age yourself. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> so, a lot of times I think, and this is my first year in the legislature, I'm from Northfield and Berlin. That's a, the territory that I represent. So we all, like Rob said, we, we all want to do what the right thing is. And we all believe strongly in what it is. And it's just how do we get from point A to point B. The Remember, when minimum wage goes up, you're going to be paying more for other stuff because everything's going to cost more. It's just the way it is, okay? The, the, the paid family leave is kind of the same way. Um, I was lucky uh, when my, uh, my former wife and I, we had two kids. Um, we were lucky we, we had great child care, all right? That is a big issue. Again, we're all trying to work on it, and it, and, and it is from getting from point A to point B. Um, but Vermont is is unique to me because we do we do do things differently and I think there's a lot of potential and we just I think we're on a great path to get to do a lot of great things that uh, you kids are already involved in and it takes a lot of courage for you to step out and get to do what you're doing and uh, that's it I'm going to make it really quick and we'll answer questions or whatever you want. Thank you. So come on up. And um, we'll open it up to, uh, to any questions. And if it's brief, we'll wrap up and you'll enjoy the outdoors for a few minutes of light and warmth, although Saturday is really the day to get out. Because uh, as a farmer, I tend to look three to seven days out for planning purposes. Uh, but uh, any questions from folks out there? Yes, please. Sure. Um, so I, I moved to, uh, to Barrytown just a couple of years ago, and I tell people that I'm close enough to the town line that they still let me be a Democrat or progressive. But I'm really interested in the fact that my town uh, votes both for Bernie Sanders and for Phil Scott. And I think that that has something to do with economics and how people think about the, econ the economy and think about what government should do for them and leads them to vote for those two people, but I don't understand. And so I'm wondering whether people on the panel could explain my neighbors to me. I'm happy to give it a shot, but I want to see if anybody else has a political analysis, uh, given that we've all engaged in the political system for a while. Here you go. Well, when I was campaigning in Barry, I kind of had that, that experience. But I mean, I think it really is just having to do with popularity or the celebrity status of, of those those people on the top of the ticket. A lot of people vote for who they know, and they just feel comfortable with Bernie, they feel comfortable with Bill Scott, and, and they, they might not know who else is, is down there. Um, I'd like to think that they're thinking a lot about the economics of the two candidates. Um, that's, that would be the uh, my optimistic thinking, I think, unfortunately. Um, that's, that's a really good question. I Personally, I think it's Vermonters still look at who the candidate is and what the issues are. You know, Phil Scott, our governor, won, I think, uh, like all 14 counties. Bernie's been very, very popular for years. I have to say, years ago, I voted for him once. 
um, you know, represented some change. But I think Vermonters are still the type that we look at who the candidate is and where they stand on the issues. I don't think we're all just about the party. I had the same experience the first year I counted votes locally, we were counting absentee ballots, and I kept getting these ballots for Bernie and Richard Snelling, who's a you know, Republican businessman who was governor. This was second run for governor, second time. And I kept saying, well, Vermonters are either very independent or schizophrenic. Uh, I have decided that Vermonters are very independent. We really do vote for the person, for the person you feel you can trust to look after your interests. Um, you know, we, we've got pretty much veto-proof uh, Senate and House, and we seem to get a Republican governor to balance that out. And I think people look at that. They look at at balance, they look at uh, the people that they're electing. They don't elect by party. People get really frustrated with party uh, primaries because they can't vote for who they want. They can only vote for one party. Uh, we're very independent and we make our decisions very independent. I'm gonna add one, one little piece of that. Uh, Senator Persson said the word popular, I would actually say familiar. Um, I think there's a lot <clears throat> to be said for voters feeling like they're familiar with who the candidate is. Uh, you know, folks asked me that very question numerous times, both after 2016 and after 2018, because of course, Governor Scott won and I won, and they said, how did that happen? And I said, frankly, people are more familiar with Governor Scott than the Democratic opponent, and People were a little more familiar in a face-to-face -face, uh, with, with me than my opponent in 16, even though he had held statewide office, uh, because I've been all over the state talking to people in meetings of three people meetings and 20 people meetings of 60 people over the course of almost 18 years of public service prior to running for lieutenant governor. Uh, so a lot of it is familiarity. Uh, sometimes I think it's a little bit of Vermonters doing the balance the two equations. Uh, I, th I think there's opportunities in the future where that might shift uh, because of the polarization of politics in Washington. Uh, depending on the turnout, for instance, in 2020, if folks come out to vote who don't often vote regularly and think in these more complex ways, they may say, with President Trump on the ballot, uh, I think a lot of those, those presidential year voters may well vote 70-30 I won't vote Republican because of Trump. Uh, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing for democracy, but I think that may impact the 2020 election if 30,000 more people vote that are party-based votes uh, more than familiarity-based votes. Or they may have options that they're equally familiar with, in which case they're gonna have to decide on something else. But I, I don't think it's as much um, the, the fundamentals of the economic issues, because again, we had folks, I would argue there's a, a number of rural working people who voted for me and Phil Scott. Probably about 30,000 to 35,000 three years ago, I haven't really quite looked at the numbers more recently, where each had the base, and then this 30,000 people that voted for both of us. Uh, and I would argue it's a, a group of folks who are um, rural, working class, a bit libertarian-esque, uh, supported Phil Scott because of a little bit of a smaller government perspective, supported me because of uh, cannabis and being a farmer. And, um, you know, it's an interesting mix because, you know, three issues become top issues and folks then pick on those two or three issues and it doesn't always delineate down by party. Uh, that's about the best answer I can give you, and I don't know if between us we gave you some answers that you think are plausible, but uh, that's our read on it. Hey, on. Well, sorry. we'll come back. I suspect we'll get a chance to revisit given the size of the crowd. Right. You know, what we hear is there's there's never enough money. I mean, Senator Cummings, you know, was an expert on that, um, and that's there's not enough money to meet the challenges of of climate. Price. We can't have a Green New Deal because we can't pay for it. We can't do anything significant. We can't actually uh, meet the basic needs of, 
of moms with kids on reach up. Uh, we can't, we really can't uh, have universal health care because who's going to pay for it? Uh, again and again, this question, uh, and yet this is the wealthiest country in the world has ever seen. Um, has the greatest levels of inequality that we've seen in this country since the 1920s. Um, and yet, there's no money. Uh, and the people who aren't organized have been taking it in the chin, really, for the last 40 years. It's been getting worse and worse. The minimum wage is less than it was in 1968. Uh, never mind the levels of inequality. So, what I want to hear is from people, what do you think we need to do to change this? Which, I, in my view, it's a question of who's organized and who isn't organized. It's a question not of justice, but it's a question of power. And I say that as someone who's been involved with the labor movement, it's a third the size of what it was when I got involved with it. That was the largest organized group of people who actually had some power to do something about this. Yeah. Anybody want to take a stab before I address some of that? You go first. <laughs> really? For public assets? You want to talk a little bit about wealth caps and uh, things? Sure. Okay. Uh, I just want to say that it's a great question, and uh, I'm asking that question too. Um, public assets, uh, we have two reports that we published. I brought the executive summary is up there on the page. One is an indicator report that takes a look at where Vermonters are and how we're doing. The second one is a solutions report. And we propose a variety of things that we really need to work on in order to reverse some of those negative indicators that we keep seeing year after year after year. Um, so we do send that um, solutions report around to all the candidates before, before statewide elections. Um, and we would love to see some organizing around those solutions. And we'd love to hear what you think about what we came up with for solutions. But I think you're right. It is about building power. And, um, and that's what we have to figure out how to do. Well, I would argue a number of things. And, and the, uh, my film crew here is going to like this one for the future. But uh, you know, Senator Sanders has talked about uh, wealthier individuals paying a higher percentage on that marginal tax rate for quite some time. And he is the most popular US senator in the country in his own state. Uh, I have advocated for a long time for a more progressive income tax structure where the resources are out there. If you actually look at graphs of, for instance, you talked about climate change, you look at carbon dioxide uh, emissions in our state and in the country uh, as a whole, they have really ballooned uh, from the 40s and it's been a J curve up. Well, the, uh, they're gonna like that one because I did this and, and that's like a rising signal, so that's good footage for you guys. But um, the other uh, graph that does the same thing uh, is income inequality and the wealth uh, gap that's happening. If you look at uh, gross domestic product from 1980 uh, to today, the overall gross domestic product has gone up on a, on a steady, slight increase. 90% of us are at that line and below as far as our income's going up. 10% are at that line and above, of which about 9% are pretty close to it. And it's that 1% that are way up high when it comes to what their wealth and incomes are now. And the premise of Reaganomics was trickle down. Somehow, if wealthy people had more money, everyday working people would end up with more. 40 years later, with continued cuts to the marginal income tax rates, to now the lowest that they've been in any kind of recent US history, if not ever, uh, has not succeeded. Trickle down was a theory. It was debunked at the time, but it has actually proven itself not to be true. Uh, I actually kind of want to use the president's words against himself. Make America great again. Well, oftentimes, if we picture the time that I think he's trying to hearken to, which is probably around the 50s, when white people had the benefit of the GAI bill, while black and brown people did not, to buy homes and build wealth, uh, you actually had a marginal income tax rate up in the 70 and 80% range. And you had money to electrify the country. 
and you had money to invest in the highway system, which built the economy. You actually had people with money recognizing that at some point, when you have more money, you're not going to put in a third pool or a fifth deck on your house. It all just goes to Wall Street now. Instead, when people who are working class have more money, they do those things. They go to the local hardware store and buy that wood and add the deck. You know, they expand an extra room on their house because they can afford to have another kid. They can pay a carpenter to do that. We talked about higher education earlier and the matriculation rate. Well, one of the things I want to talk about is not only more accessible higher education and free tuition eventually for higher education, but also making sure there's no shame in going to a technical high school and getting proficient in electrical work and plumbing work and all the other you know, technical jobs that right now, we don't have enough people doing that work, and yet they're, you, know, you can make a good middle class living. Last time you paid an electrician or a plumber, you would know that. Uh, and you think it's a high rate, but they also gotta pay for their truck and they gotta pay for their supplies. There's expenses in those 40 and $50 an hour jobs, uh, and there's odd hours and there's some struggles. But you can be that person who doesn't get a college education and it can actually uh, sometimes make more than some of the folks getting college degrees. So all of these things are incorporated into this conversation, but fundamentally, if we want an economy for all, then wealthier folks who have seen their economy, their economics balloon, not necessarily the small business owners as Representative Claire was talking about, and I'll talk about that as a small business owner. I write the front of that check. And it's gonna be a challenge, and it would be a challenge for me if minimum wage went to $15 an hour next year. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a steady and predictable increase for those of us who are employers, and an increase that is above the rate of inflation so that working people who have been falling farther and farther behind year by year over the last 50 years since that 1968 day when the minimum wage was higher uh, than it is today. But if we can raise it at a rate higher than inflation so people can start to dig back out from the hole that we've created for them under Reaganomics trickle down, hold minimum wage flat, which was supposed to create this economic uh, panacea, which has not, then we can get somewhere. And we can actually reduce some of those government services and expenses that Senator Cummings was talking about because we are subsidizing folks who we have underpaid for their productivity. Productivity has gone up two, three, four, five times over those periods of time, if not more so. And yet the workers aren't getting the benefit of that. You know, if folks didn't have to work 50 or 60 hours a week, and we're working 40 hours a week, and we're home for dinner with their family, how many of those families and how many of those kids would have with that stability and that guidance by their parents, maybe circumstances that wouldn't lead them into circumstances that then down the line cost us as a society more money because they, they need more effort to help in the schools because they haven't had a parent reading them a book at night because one parent is gone to the second shift or third shift to work and the other parent who's working 60 hours a week is too darn exhausted or they're trying to deal with the home issues that need to be dealt with and no one's reading to the kid. Well, when you're home to read to that kid at night or do that math homework with that child, they're better, or, or not even homework, when they're two, three, four years old, it's not homework, but just being with them, playing with the toys that end up teaching them math skills and, and social skills and so forth, and they get to school unprepared to learn at five and six years old, that costs us more. So we're being penny wise, penny wise, pound foolish not to have an economic system where those folks can be home with their kids. So it's a long and, and varied answer to your question, but I think it really describes how our economy has completely fallen apart for working people under the guise of trickle down economics. And if we aren't willing to confront that reality and say, you've made a ton of money on the system, particularly those who are in that 300, 600, a million dollar a year income, time to contribute back to making it so that everybody benefits from this incredible opportunity that we have, then uh, who are we? What are our moral values? What are our family values? Because this economic system does not represent good morals and does not represent good family values in the way that I would describe those words. Yes, in the back. So to add, I, everything you're saying, I so agree with that, that same thing. It just seems, though, that the only, the, the only way to do things is to have more revenue. But that's right. To raise more revenue is generally through some kind of tax. 
That's absolutely right. And then it seems like it's political suicide when anybody talks about raising taxes. Right. So how do we get past that? That's my question is how do we understand that if you can take care of a, of a, of a child that is so much cheaper than paying for them when they're in the correctional facility, but we can seem to get there. And I think of you know, some, of some countries where they have you know, of child care and elder care and all that stuff, and they're paying six Seventy percent of their salaries are going to taxes, but then it's done, and we're paying it anyway. We're just paying it here and here. We don't. So, how, so my question always is, how do we get past that? How do we get to a point where we all feel like we're in it together, and we're going to pay our equal share, and have it not be like you know? And the happiness index in many of those countries is actually quite a bit higher than our own. But uh, Representative Leclerc wanted to answer, and I again have thoughts, but I want to make sure anybody else who has thoughts is right one off. Um, thank you. I, um, I'm not going to speak to the national and federal stuff because, one, that just is not what you'd like to me to do, and two, quite honestly, I'm not going to have any impact on that. But I will talk a little bit about affordability in Vermont. This year, we're on track with the annual leave, the increase of fuel tax, and some other stuff that's down there. We're going to have $100 million, $110 million, and we're not done yet, tax increases on the line. It happens every year. Now, part of this is about priorities. Let's talk about clean water. You know, they're saying that we're not spending enough money on clean water. This year, Vermont, we're going to spend $47.8 million on clean water. We've spent that for many, many years. If you go through and take a look at what we spent on working on cleaning up the lake and other bodies of water, we spent hundreds of millions of dollars. This year, out of our general fund budget, which is about $1.7 billion, which is basically the money that we have direct control over from Montpelier, about $250 million of that is going to go to pay for pensions. It's either to catch us up where we should have been or to pay us for our current obligations. It's quite a chunk of money out of that. Remember we had single-payer health care under the Shumlin administration and we got the Health Connect? Well, you know, we started down a path with that. We built the whole infrastructure around that thing. We've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on that. I've run into many, many people who say, I pay a premium, but I still can't get health care. I can't afford my co-pays. I can't afford my deductibles. And God forbid if I have anything happen, the amount of insurance that I have to pay left over would still put me under. So it's about priority. Yeah, it's always about money. But if I could just say, Oop. they are no. all priority. Let's let, yeah, let's let, let him finish. Let, we'll get back. Let's let him finish. I, I just, I'm not sure if you're answering my question. But we'll, we'll get there. But let him finish. I can respect that it's your priority, but somebody else is going to come in and they got a priority. We've got a major opioid crisis. That's a priority. Child care is a priority. My daughter and son-in-law pay $2,000 a month to put their two kids in child care. Don't you think that doesn't cause some talk around the dinner table at night? We're all in this together. Do you want to offer anything before I? So I, I, uh, I think Representative Leclerc touched on something pretty important, which is uh, the word affordability. Uh, and I'll get back to taxes as well. Um, Public Assets Institute uh, put out a report earlier this year that I put in my newsletter, which I want to point out, if you don't get my electronic newsletter, you're welcome to sign up. It's a one-page, uh, two-sided document, uh, but it's electronic. Delete works if you don't like the topic. Comes out every couple weeks with some different issues. And the issue of affordability came up uh, because Public Assets did a report that showed that, on average, uh, and these are averages, everybody's individual circumstance is absolutely going to be unique. Um, the cost of living in Vermont is about 1.8% higher than the national average. Okay? A lot of this country is also in the northern climate, and you have higher road costs and winter living costs and so forth. Um, I want to point out road costs, back to Senator Kurtzlick being on transportation. Every year we keep saying, the roads seem worse and worse and worse. What's going on? Well, it used to be that we froze. And there was always a season of freezing and thawing. But we kind of froze and went through that season in the fall, and then it stayed frozen. 
and then it thawed in the spring and they had a few weeks of freezing and thawing and, and the roads got crumbled during those couple of three to four week windows. Well now, that three to four week window is a three to four month window. And that freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing all winter long is what's destroying our roads. So yeah, they're in worse and worse shape. We're pouring tons of money into maintenance of our roads and bridges and highways. But it's an uphill battle when we're fighting against climate change. So again, we don't tackle climate change, we have these costs that come upon us. So I varied off. Our expenses are 1.6% above the national average. Our incomes are 18% below the national average. And so this goes back to the failed trickle-down uh, thought process that somehow incomes will rise because wealthy people have more money. That hasn't happened. We also have some unique statistics for Vermont that um, are neither a left, nor right, nor blue, nor red factor. Rural America across this country is hemorrhaging people and hemorrhaging jobs. What you don't see when you compare state to state, however, is that most, of other rural, most other rural states still have one big city that actually is often half their state's population when you include the suburban area. We have one big county that would be far-fetched to be called a city, even though most of rural Vermont, you know, most of Vermont looks up at, at Burlington area and says, oh, that's like Vermont, it's not part of Vermont. It's still not really a big city compared to most places. And as strong as the economy is up there, and as much as it is sending money throughout the state, even though people think it gets more, it's just like the northern states and the southern states, it's a sending area for the overall economy of the state. It is not proportionally big enough to carry the state the way that many of these other rural states are. So we really do have a demographic challenge, but it's not about blue and red policies, it's about rural and urban, and we just don't have urban. You look at northern uh, New Hampshire, they're facing the exact same problems we are. Now New Hampshire doesn't have that big city within its borders, but it does have that big city within distance for the economy, which is Boston. So some of these things we deal with are unique to Vermont, but we need to make sure we don't start using the word affordability or the economic circumstances or the demographics of youth and rural areas as a blue-red issue. It's just a demographic reality issue, regardless of the blueness of the red. You go to rural Nebraska, it's hollowing out. Rural Montana, it's hollowing out. They just happen to have a city or areas that also help drive the economy, or they have oil you know, or coal. Um, but I do want to get back to your original point, which is taxes and revenues and having enough to pay for it. And the bottom line is, every time you hear no new taxes, what ends up happening most of the time, and I'll give Governor Scott credit, he found a way to hold the line, although I think it hurt the state, in not, not only not raising taxes, but not raising fees. But typically, when we don't raise taxes, we do raise fees. And when I say we, it's the political world. And it's that courage issue. And it's a lot easier to say, well, your fishing license is going to go up by $3, which might be 10%, or your hunting license, or your car registration, or all of these other ways that we nickel and dime the working class people to death. Because when you raise a fishing license by $3, when you're making $200,000 a year, that doesn't bother you. But when you're making $30,000 a year, that $3 matters a lot more as a percentage of your income and your ability to pay your heating bill or buy one gift at Christmas or Hanukkah for your kid or their birthday. And so when we continue to hold the line on broad-based taxes that are based on ability to pay and instead nickel and dime the population to death, yeah, they have every right to be mad. And so some of those voters that maybe vote for Phil Scott and vote for me, they hear me talk about that and they go, there's a lefty that gets that those fees hurt. And just last week, there was a vote in the House relating to heating fuel to weatherize homes. Now, I encourage some folks to offer an amendment to say, let's do that on a marginal income tax rate, not on a heating fuel rate. And it got voted down overwhelmingly, that idea, because the political wind said, this is the way to do it. Some, some power people said, that's the way to do it. We, we can't have wealthy people pay a few more bucks. They'll leave. Well, those statistics were just completely debunked. And now you have uh, one caucus saying, look, it's a really regressive tax. We're all voting against it because it's a regressive tax. Well, they had the opportunity to vote for a progressive tax, and they also voted no. 
So it's important to ask politicians who make a big deal out of the regressivity of a tax to say, well, you really aren't for weatherization if you're also going to vote against it when it's not a regressive tax. Be honest about, you voted no no matter what on the tax side. So then if it's about finding money, tell us what you're going to cut in order to pay for it. Now I agree we're spending uh, 48, 50 million dollars a year on water quality and in some respects we're throwing good money after bad. So why not take 250,000 of that and look into creating potentially a research, maybe it'll be right, maybe it won't come up with a result, of is there a marketplace for valuing the product of our dairy farms for more than just the product that it is, but other products that it could be? Like, would people in Boston pay 50 cents more a gallon? I don't know, but would they if they knew that the farms that were getting paid for that milk actually were sequestering carbon, quote, ecosystem services, or that those farms were had more animals out on pasture? I don't know what the, the thing is that wealthier folks and middle-income folks in Connecticut and Boston, New York would pay for. What is the thing they'd pay more for if they knew they were paying more for a product that meant more than just milk in a bottle? Maybe it's that Vermont's somatic cell count is lower so it can be marketed as healthier milk. Who knows? But if we don't spend $250,000 doing that to find out of a way to maybe bring millions more dollars into farmers' pockets, which would then be way more than we're spending as a state on practices to mitigate agricultural impacts on our water or transportation impacts that, that impact our water, then um, why aren't we looking at some of these other ways to spend our money better? I think sometimes the, the language is right, that we've been throwing money out. What is it doing? What are we getting for our dollar? I know on climate change, there was a study that showed what where to spend a dollar to get the most carbon reduction, to have the biggest impact. And a lot of it is weatherization. But if we're going to be proud as a political body to go from 800 houses a year to 1,300 houses a year, when to reach the goal we set a number of years ago of 80,000 weatherized homes by 2020, and so far we've weatherized 25,000, which means the next two years we have to weatherize 55,000, pretty sure we're not going to get there. We're definitely not going to get there at 1,300 homes a year, which is only 2,600 over these next two years. If we don't take climate change seriously, very, very seriously, and aren't willing to, yes, raise some taxes on the wealthiest to put money into the things that will have the greatest impact to, ta to tackle climate change, our sugaring season is going to get shorter and less productive. Our ski industry is going to get shorter and shorter and less productive. And we're going to have to rewrite our whole economy. Why aren't we taxing to put money into broadband so people don't have to drive as much on these roads and could have good economic opportunities in their homes? I mean, back in those great 50s when America was great again, or was great for some, we decided as a society it was worth taking public resources and electrifying our country. Broadband is that next economy. Are we going to decide we have the money to do that? Or are we going to continue to put it down into Wall Street so handfuls will own more wealth than the majority of the country combined. Bernie's got those statistics like nobody's business. So I agree with you. And I'm more than happy to have the debate with anybody out there, including my friends at the Republican Governors Association, that wealthy people can't afford to pay more. And frankly, if they don't start wishing to do so, which actually many wealthy Vermonters are willing to do, then they're going to see the result as a completely collapsing economy because working people are struggling. They're working 60 hours, 70 hours. There's a breaking point. And we're there. The population is angry. It's angrier in some other parts of the country, but it's angry here. It's just that we're often too nice to express it. But people are struggling. Affordability is real. Um, but anyway, I've gone on here in the front. Two issues on climate change I'm interested in talking about. The first one is how do we incentivize landlords to weatherize their places when the tenant is paying the heat? The second one is I'd like to know more about the incentives for getting more people to buy electric cars uh, because uh, the Vermont the PD Digger had a the other night, but basically showed we have to change over by 
about 90,000 cars to electric to meet the Paris That's right, so I'll take that as second first. And that's where there is agreement. Like the Governor Scott did agree to the Paris Climate Accord goals. And one way to get there is 90,000 goals. It doesn't have 90,000 electric cars. It doesn't have to be 90,000. But you do a whole bunch of different things. One of those things should be 90,000 electric cars. Um, there, there, and another agreement is the governor put $1.5 million in the budget this year for electric vehicles. So there will be an incentive program. Some of us are trying to get more money for the electric vehicle program because there was, his, the Governor's Climate Commission recommended that all four, I think four, $4.5 million that was left over from the VW money go to that, but it got used for other funds because other uses in the general fund. So it's gonna be a fight to get that. But there will be incentives. It's gonna be targeted to low and moderate income Vermonters. We're also looking at other programs in the transportation committee to, to help low income just buy very efficient cars. So it could be like a used Prius hybrid, you, you can get 45 miles to the gallon and you can buy one for $6,000 or some people that just have no vehicle. And that would be, I think, a gain for, for low income folks, but also a gain for the, for the environment and for our carbon goals because they'll be a much more efficient car. So the, those are gonna, I'm, very confident that'll pass and we will have incentives for electric vehicles, but that's gonna be after it passes and get signed by the governor, so it'll be later in the summer, hopefully, when it first comes out. And, then I, and there's interest definitely in the committee and from VTrans, that's from the folks in the governor's administration of, that we're gonna to have to keep doing this. But the question will end up being, with like everything else we've talked about, is where is the money gonna come from? So we're, we're talking about that now, that we know this 1.5 will only go so far, what's going to be the next thing. We don't want to just do that demand because we, we do want to get to really transforming all of our transportation off of fossil fuels into electricity. The split incentive of the landlords is a tough one to do, and there are programs, Efficiency Vermont runs programs, they, they market to landlords and try to explain why it's, it's good for them if their, their tenants have just more comfortable, healthier home and pay less for heating, then they have more money to to pay rent if, that, if that's an issue. Um, but also there's been some in, innovative programs where they just go out and, and give money to the landlords to say, like, hey, here, at least let us do an audit and let us investigate your building and what, what it would take to weatherize it and can we work with you to get it done? Because you're right, they don't have an immediate incentive to get it done. So there's some thinking about that when we're, we're doing some experimental programs to see what works. There is a tax, uh, there is a, there's a grant program I'll tell you about. I can touch on that. I'm one of those mean old landlords that people complain about a lot. I happen to be the type that I pay with my utilities for my tenants, but most landlords that I know, in fact all landlords are, we care about our tenants. And, but Vermont has a lot of really old housing stock. And most of our rental property is really quite old. And in some cases, you know, we can't compete with the, uh, the, private, the public sector. There's a project down in Montpelier where they did 18 apartments over Aubuchon Hardware. They did 18 apartments to the tune of $6.1 million. It's $340,000 an apartment. And those are all subsidized housing. You know. Talk about priorities, I mean, we could probably put, and those are one bedroom apartments, so the most you're gonna house is two people. I, as a private woman, I can't compete with that, um, nor should I have to. But if we're really talking about housing and getting people home, then we need to take a look and reprioritize. That's one of the issues that the tenant governor brought up. We're talking about no new fees and no new taxes. That's true. We didn't have any for two years. But what we didn't do was no prior programs got cut. If I remember right, I think last year our budget still, we still spent more to the tune of almost $90 million with no new fees and no new taxes than we did the year before. So it's not like that we're running around there cutting programs that people need. It's just that the money came in by a different way with no new fees and no new taxes. And I'll tell you, with all the campaigning I've done, I have not had one person tell me, Rob, 
My property taxes are too low. The cost of living in Vermont is too low. Please go to Montpelier and do something about that. I appreciate that. We also uh, had a government holdup for $33 million that could have gone to pay those teacher retirement funds down, which would have saved the state $100 million over the long run. Uh, and works towards lowering taxes in the long run. So these are the debates we have is spend money now or spend more money later uh, or don't spend money now and spend a lot more later. Uh, and so, and I too am an evil landlord, uh, but I've invested in weatherization in my properties. But I think some of it is um, also what is the market like? I think you know if you're a landlord in the Burlington area or in areas where there's a greater demand for housing uh, than there's housing, there's also a, a higher rate of income for the landlords and an easier ability to do that. Uh, in some of the rural parts of the state, I talked to some landlords who have a hard time renting their apartments or their houses that they have. And so sometimes one size fits all is, is not always the answer. But the state does have grant programs for landlords uh, and the requirement of the landlord is to keep rent level for one year in order to get the grant. So it's a pretty generous package ultimately because if you often weatherize or improve your home, that property, you've also increased the value of that property more than what that differential would have been in rent for one year. Um, so there's, these are the healthy debates that we have. Um, and the gentleman there had a follow-up, I think. You had your hand up earlier. I don't know if you still remembered what it was. Give anybody else a chance, but yeah. uh, Then we do have some firsts. Sorry, I didn't realize. Yes, Dan. Senator Burson, I have a fairly specific question. Is the science settled that uh, electric vehicles have a, a smaller car than either hybrids or, or gasoline power cars? Yeah, I think so. You think so? Is there well, I mean, you can always, there are people out there that say it's not true, but the stuff that I've looked at, I think it's pretty clear that it is, especially in Vermont where we have a clean electricity grid, you know, we're, and we're moving cleaner and cleaner every year with our renewable energy standard. So it is, it's a function of hydro power plus nuclear power, so that so the it's not even nuke anymore. Right. We have a little bit of nuke from Seabrook. Oh, yeah, we don't have a lot of nuke in our But that's, that, that helps Vermont than compared to if you're in Ohio where there's a lot of coal, and then if you take the life cycle of the car, it does bring down the, the life cycle. In that, in that situation, it's coal fired. Is there a break even point 20 miles to the gallon? There, there are, I have seen studies, and they show even like maps. If you live here, you know, electricity is, is, you know, electric car is going to be more carbon neutral than if you, than you live here. Or, so there, there, are, there have been that analysis that I've seen, it, but it's, it's clear that in Vermont, with our electric grid, or even in New England, that where we have barriers, we have no coal. So, but where our, we do get the coal pollution coming into our state, but we don't have any coal generation. The last coal generation plant is closed in, in Massachusetts. Did you have your hand up? And then we'll go to So back. I was thinking about our young people, and I have uh, one boy in college and one heading to college. And I'm wondering, we're talking about affordability, and we're talking about um, minimum wage, and protecting you know, the small businesses. But what are the opportunities? Are, are our young people leaving the state? And if they are, you know, what can we do to change that? And what are the opportunities for kids to come, you know, either stay in the state or come back if they need for college? Um, are we talking about that? How are we addressing that? Public access has some data on that. <laughs> um, I can answer a little bit. Uh, yes, young people are leaving Vermont, and young people from other states are coming to Vermont. Um, it's about even. You can see um, this migration data that we have. We break it down by income, we break it down by age. Um, it's amazing how symmetrical it is. Um, it's really pretty cool, so um, so do check that out. Um, I don't know how to answer the question. Where, where would they check that out? What website? Publicassets.org. Um, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I don't know how to answer the part about you know how do you know how do we make this a better place? There's so many ways we can do that, and I think it gets to the other question. Um, it's frustrating to not be able to do all these things that we want to do. Um, and we talk about needing to raise revenues. I tend to think we need to have a vision before we're going to figure out 
how we're going to get there. Um, free college is part of that vision, right? We want kids to be able to get education um, and not be burdened um, for most of their adult lives with that debt. So um, there's a lot of ideas about how we do these things. I'd like to see it all together, um, a big vision of, of the economy that works for all. We'll get there in a second. I'm just going to let the panel answer. We are thinking about it. We're working on it. I think the lieutenant governor said rural America is bleeding their young people. I had a representative from a national bank come and talk to me today just because he's supposed to be finance chairs in his district. But he was saying they have a, a research facility in Jersey City and the young people are flocking to Jersey City. Now that's just not a place I think of flocking to. But young people now are going there. We have a crisis in workers in this state. We cannot get workers in any of the health-related fields. Part of that is that ongoing need and tension is we have not raised our Medicaid rates, which Places like the mental health agencies depend on, that's, that's their income. If we don't raise it, you can't ask somebody for a master's level social work position with all that college debt to work for $35,000 a year and not much uh, anticipation of a raise. You can't do it. We, we're trying to get the money to raise that. But I agree, we need a vision. I have voted to raise the income tax at least twice since the recession and prevail. I think there's some elasticity at the top end, but we are not, you know, our richest people, we actually had a chart today, the, the top 1% in Vermont is right there with Missouri and Iowa and, you know, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, they're way over there. Their wealthiest 1% are wealthy. Ours are wealthy, but not that wealthy. And there aren't that many of them. So I think there's some elasticity there. But I think we've spent that elasticity at least 10 times over. We've got to decide what do we want to do, what's most important. And I think people will, you know, if we're clear, not well, we're taking it because you've got it and we want it. But this is our need, and this is what we need to spend it on. Then we'll do it. Our kids will come back. This is a good place to raise kids. I've got four children. Three of them are here and have come back to Vermont. The fourth is in Montreal, and we can't compete with the Canadian system or Montreal. Uh, that's the way it is. Uh, we can't win them all. But, we, we are a good place to raise kids. We need to market ourselves that way. Oops. And uh, one or two points on that, and then we're going to take one last question uh, from the back who hasn't asked. But a couple of things. I think. I have a question, but I'd like to answer first. Well, you can answer as in a conversation with her. There's a little bit of a panel situation. We're just going to run out. But um, we could talk about how our rural schools are actually better performing than equal demographic rural schools all over the country. We are getting more for what we pay. Uh, so we can talk about our good schools. We can talk more about our safe communities, because compared to a lot of places in the Boston, Connecticut, New York areas, we are safer. So you want to attract people. We could invest in broadband so that folks who are in that newer economy could live and work in Vermont and maybe travel to clients in southern New England once a month to visit with them for two days or three days and two nights, but could live and work in Vermont. We could follow what the governor talked about, which was an engineering company in the Northeast Kingdom that advertised jobs in a mountain biking magazine and got more applicants than they needed versus the engineering company in Virgins that's still looking for employees. We need to market what we are, not try to change to be what everybody else is. What we are actually is pretty darn attractive to a lot of folks, but we don't do a good job of marketing it out there. Um, uh, save for my family. I would also say, just to touch on our Planned Parenthood folks that are here, I think a lot of young people are looking for states that welcome family planning and conversations 
and safety in their communities and access to reproductive freedom and choice. Now, maybe not every young person wants that, but it's the vast majority when you survey young people about women's autonomy, they're gonna go places where women's autonomy is valued. So we should tout that and say, women are welcome here. Women are welcome to do family planning and think about when they wanna have families and explore their careers and plan when they're gonna have a child. Um, not too bad, made a mistake. Right? So I think there's things that we can tout that will attract people to the state, but there's also just raw demographics. Young people want to go to cities, but then they might want to move back when they're a little older. In the back, I think, is the last question. Um, I actually have two points. Uh, one, I just wanted to provide a little bit of context. I'm new here. Two of them, I'm not here a year ago with my wife. Um, I'm, a small business, I'm a small business owner. I'm a landlord. Okay. Uh, I'm also new here. And I would just like to say that um, one of the things I continually hear about minimum wage or about weatherizing houses that I don't like is that people take on these responsibilities, but they don't want to pay for them. I'm not a landlord, okay? I'm a business owner. It costs, it costs money. It's expensive. That's your responsibility. You took on that responsibility. So if you have to weatherize your house, I just put out $21,000 to put a new roof on our house, okay? I think that's come from the territory. We took on that responsibility. You can't put that responsibility on someone else. Okay, because you do get the benefits as well. But I just want to say, um, in, a, in a general sense, there's a lot of things you can't put, you can't quantify. It's hard. I, I grew up in Los Angeles, I'm a whole life in California. It's hard to express to somebody what it's like when you come out here and the sun goes down and it's actually night. I, that's, I mean, I, I don't really, I mean, that's. Little tiny things like that, the very fact that we're all going to leave here and get in our cars, we're going to drive five minutes and we'll be home, or even for those of us who are going to drive an hour, you're not going to be in traffic. Those little tiny things that you can't quantify, they're miraculous. But I'm just saying, I'm saying that as an outsider. I've been here a year, I absolutely love it here, but there's a lot of things that we don't have to think about day to day that is extraordinary. And I just thought maybe I'd like to provide some context. I think that's a, a great note yeah, to wrap and up. By the way, I'm at the State House every single day, all day long. <laughs> I listen to you guys talk all day long. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you still like Vermont. That's good. Um, and it's like the fish who's in water. And we are in air. You don't recognize it, right, until you're not in it. Um, we live in an amazing place. And that's back to that idea of marketing what we have. And you've touched on some of those intangibles that are less statistically describable than some of the things I mentioned. But I do really appreciate that. I want to say um, thank you to everyone. I also want to mention uh, Representative Ann Donahue from Northfield joined us partway through and heard a lot of the conversation. Uh, I want to thank the representatives and senators and our le guest leaders from different organizations talking about some of these issues, rights and democracy, uh, and everybody else who uh, sponsored this town hall that we're actually hosting all across the state. I think we're in Bennington on Sunday uh, is the next one. Uh, we've really been to many corners of the state uh, and had great conversations. And I just, in closing, before I introduce Dan to come up and close us out, I just want to say, when you see those videos about me uh, in campaign ads, if you happen to have context you can offer people versus the snippet they take of my arm going like this, please feel free to do so, because uh, truth and transparency is important. In any case, uh, Dan, please, if you want to speak to this, uh, the closing of the event. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Yeah, Right to Democracy is really happy to be the main sponsor of these town halls. We are in Bennington on uh, Sunday, if you have any friends and family in Bennington. And our last one is in White River Junction on the 22nd. So friends and family in White River Junction, we'd love to see you guys out there. Um, we've been all over the state. We've heard a lot from people and a lot of different elected officials. I mean, I think there's an agreement that we need an economy that works for all of us. I think there's an agreement that there's actually a moment right now where we can actually get things done. And real important legislation is being discussed in Montpelier, right? There's real important raise the wage and family leave. It does, like legislation, that can be passed this year. And so it's really crucial that you call, if they're not sitting in the room right now, and some of them are, you call your representative, you call your senator, you push for them to pass these bills, you push for them to do as much as they can this year, and they won't be able to do everything, and then we'll come back in January and we'll push for them to do as much as they can again. So we can have a real difference. If folks are interested in, in economy work, in climate work, 
work in um, healthcare work, rights and democracy at radvt.org. We're happy to have you guys as part of the team. And um, I, I definitely want to make sure we give one last hand to the, the organizers of this, this event. We, while Rad is the organization that organized, it was really uh, Mia and Ginger who did a lot of the organization. So thank you much. Thank you so much. And thank you all for coming.